today's activity. Thanks, Melanie. Just see the recording switch on then. So diving into today's activity, um, we've really been motivated by a number of different things. Um, the first aspect of motivation was, <clears throat> excuse me, back at eResearch 2019 in Brisbane, um, a number of us held a <clears throat> and participated in a bird, birds of a feather activity up there, looking at spatial services across the country. And it was very evident back in October, November last year, as we we're having discussions around spatial services, that, a space, that Australia's geospatial data and services landscape is, is really changing quite rapidly um, with a number of different new capabilities, updated programs, and essentially whether it's funding programs or government programs, and responsibilities or remits associated with those programs. And what was becoming apparent was that people really were unsure about what were some of the communication technologies that are going on, would it being adopted at different levels to actually facilitate the flow of data between services in this landscape, but more so where were these actual services that are out there? Um, so the motivation for today and the question we're looking to answer in today's community practice was, is principally, what geospatial meta data services are available and where? Now, this question is rather broad, and I've seen in, in some of the mirror board stuff coming on there already at the moment, that this is a really huge space. We're, we're, aware of, we're very aware of that. So we're gonna try and break this down a little bit over the next couple of slides. So the aim of today, um, is to actually to try and start creating a picture of Australia's geospatial data and services landscape. Now, when I say start, um, we're gonna have an initial mapping exercise, which is what we're doing today, which is having a bit of a play, um, creating a bit of a mud map, so to speak, to really start to put some of these different services and different data stores or whatever it may be in an environment and start to get people thinking about what's actually out there and what are some of the connections between these different objects um, similar to how we're maybe out there surveying or mapping a landscape, we're actually going to do it in the digital world um, to actually think about, well, what's available and how do we connect to it? Um, the second step of this, which we won't actually cover in today's meeting, but we'll actually do in a future meeting, is to actually try and start to flesh things out a little bit more. Um, this may actually be um, setting up a working group around this activity, or it may invite people who are champions or leaders in this space um, to actually comment on different aspects here, whether it's from OGC or whether it's from Geoscience Australia, to help us to start to, to understand the landscape and how we may actually make the connections between different things. There are a number of different existing groups that are out there at the moment to actually facilitate these connections, whether we're looking at metadata or they're looking at the communication side of things. Um, so there's a huge amount of resources that are currently available. So in the community of practice space, we're really trying to develop a community around this landscape to actually try and make connections that within, within this area. So to get things started today, we thought we might start off with a very simple example. So my name's Michael, Michael Rigby from Oran. And I thought what, what I'd do is provide a bit of a presentation on what Oran looks like and how we might consider, I guess, the spatial components of Oran, but more so the data and services landscape from my perspective. Now at Oran, we may consider a number of different objects, say the Australian Bureau of Statistics and data.gov.au, and how Oran as an object or an entity really would connect between these. So, Oren would consume data from the ABS and try and make it available to its users in different ways. It then would feed that information back, the metadata side of thing and the data itself out via data.gov.au as an example. Now, this is a very simple, I guess, service chain and we can actually start to break this down in a little bit more detail. So here we're looking at obviously objects and the relations between them. In this case, we've obviously got directed relationships here. And in some cases, whether it's metadata or data, whatever it may be, things may look a little bit different. On the object side of things, we actually may have organizations, very high level, say ABS, ORAN, or data.gov.au. These objects, obviously, depending on the, the actual person's perspective, may be defined at different levels. 
But specifically within these, we're very, we're very much interested in four main parts. That being a data store, the data itself, metadata, and say a metadata registry. The relationships between these objects within an organization may then be the data or the metadata connections between these. And as I said before, these are often directed. So whether data is being updated or harvested, there is a particular flow of information between these entities. Now, for those obviously in the geospatial um, world or particular areas of expertise, uh, we can think of a whole bunch of different applications which may draw on a bunch of different technologies within this space. Touched on a few already, and a few of these are actually uh, core components of a number of these different organizations when it comes to serving out um, spatial data or metadata. And we'll come to these a little bit later on. So I guess in the back of our minds, we do have, I guess, a simple view of the landscape and looking at organizations very high level. And as we dive down into the detail, suddenly, you know, things may get a little bit more um, granular. So if we were to look at these two objects, the Australian Bureau of Statistics and data.gov.au, and look at Oren here, I've just zoomed in a little bit here into Oren, with the, with the mindset to take these different connections and think about well, how does Oren actually connect to the ABS and how does it then sort of feed its metadata out to data.gov.au to actually facilitate the use of data and metadata in different ways. Now within Oren, we do have a number of different geo server instances. And if we're consuming data from ABS, this is an example only, we may connect to the, their STMX endpoint, whether that's the, the older one or the new version 2.1, doesn't matter. Um, and we actually may connect that into the geo server and then within Oren, do some sort of manipulations to actually curate a version of that data set, whether it's a derived product, adding geometry to it, um, whatever it may be, and serving that information, whether it's metadata or data, back out to other entities such as data.gov.au. In the CCAN example, we can think about metadata being harvested from Oren CCAN as a WMS, and metadata records being stored in a metadata repository within CCAN. Understand that CCAN is also a data store as well, but not going to go into too much detail there. Now this is also the case for GeoServer. We do have a data store on that side as well. And that data store obviously is, is um, connecting to the SDMX and feeding things out. Now what happens in the middle? Well, this is up to, I guess, the, another, another level of, I guess, uh, of this diagram, which I haven't displayed here, but I have shown it in the mirror board. Um, but really, it really depends upon the person, the individual's level and perspective on how they're going to challenge this task, how they're actually going to approach this task. Because some people are going to understand the, the organizational entities quite well. Other people aren't really going to understand so much what's outside of their organization, but more what's going on inside. So we're very much aware of that. So to start to, to map Australia's geospatial data and services landscape, we thought we'd have this mirror board um, as a collaborative environment. And for those who joined the call early, they've had a bit of a play around with it. And we've posted some links in the chat window to actually start engaging with that. And within this environment, what we'll do is we'll do a quick overview of Miro and look at how do we start to set up these interactions at different levels. And what we're gonna do is to actually facilitate discussions, we're gonna use the Zoom breakout feature to actually take the 29 participants who are now on this call and split them out into a number of different groups. Now, people who are assigned a group, they may leave a group and join another one. Um, but we just wanted to, having so many voices on the call, um, we didn't want to throw everybody in into one meeting and have them all talking on top of one another. We want to sort of allow people to sort of form their own groups within this space. But initially we have to split it out somehow. So once we've got, got the breakout room set up, and we'll do that in a moment, we'll then walk through the Oren example 
um, within the mirror environment and get things going there. So um, to get started, um, probably have about five groups of six, I think is probably a good way to get going. And we'll set those up right now within the Zoom platform. And hopefully we'll receive a, a notification about um, that occurring. Michael, and then, yes, Kieran. We might want to walk through the Oren example on Miro before we break, go into breakout groups. Sure, okay. All right, well, now I'll jump over into Miro and let's have a look there. So for those who have come in um, recently, the Miro link we've just posted in the chat window. In Miro, as I said before, is a collaborative environment to actually explore um, a, diff a number of different spaces. And within the Miro environment, you'll see a number of what we call, I guess, pages or sections. And by zooming and panning, you'll actually see these sections. But we'll actually switch over to the Miro environment now, and I'll see you there soon. You'll recognize me by um, my pointer. Um, otherwise, feel free to add some questions in the chat window. I'll touch base in about 30 seconds. And if anyone's having trouble with me or if you just want to put a note on the chat and we'll try and help you with it. Okay, so over in the mirror world now, sounds a bit weird saying the mirror world, but mirror world, you'll see a number of different sections here. The first one being the introduction page, and we've kind of covered off that a little bit here. We were looking at the different aspects and overall here on the right hand side, you'll see a number of different um, dialogue boxes and things but to start you off with the introduction to the Miro user interface we have a second slide here which actually tells you about how to actually use Miro. Now on the top right hand corner you'll see a ways in which we can actually track each of the different users and you can see their cursors and you can decide to follow them. There's a whole bunch of different guests at the moment which is fine. You'll see mine currently hovering over the practice page. And on the left-hand side here, you'll see the actual contact page. So if you would like to all follow me, what I thought we'd do, we just have a quick look at the Miro practice page. We've got a first icebreaker activity here, which is to actually create a sticky note to introduce yourself. For those who have already done this, fantastic. It's really great to see. Um, I am very aware that we've had a number of people who have actually joined the call afterwards. So please add a sticky note. You'll need to come over here to the left-hand side. And the sticky note is the fourth option down on the left-hand side and then draw a sticky note on the page. Please list your name, your organization, and for a bit of fun, um, or make perhaps a, a recent book, podcast, or movie or, that you found interesting. For, the, for, the, for those of us that are in lockdown, we may have watched probably a little bit too much of Netflix or on-demand SBS, whatever it may be, um, or read lots of books. Um, be great to, to see what we've got there. Once again, if you have any questions about the mirror environment, um, feel free to use the, the Zoom chat window at the moment. And we'll get into those Zoom breakouts um, once we've gone through this board.
And if anyone's struggling with using Miro, just now be a good time to shout out and then sort that out. All right, for those who have added their sticky note, it's really good to see. We've got some really good stuff there. Um, and uh, everything from, well, I've just finished watching the lives of others, really kind of a little bit on the edge sort of stuff around um, uh, society. Um, we've got some really good stuff there around some of the different um, magazines potentially people are reading. Um, yeah. Great to see some stuff and people getting out there and having uh, some different sorts of experiences. So with that done, hopefully you've got a little bit of an insight into how to use Mirror in terms of drawing a um, sticky note on the page. And what I thought I'd do now is I'll just uh, head over to the third board and walk through an example of what we're looking to achieve in this activity today understanding that we have different perspectives. Some people may be managers and they've got a very high level view of the data and services landscape. Other people may be technical experts and they know a lot about the organization and its different capabilities. So our intention here is to allow people different ways to engage with activity. Some people may be really good at maybe saying, well, data from ABS is, you know, is shown in data.gov.au. I don't know how it's shown, but I can draw a connection between the two. Other people may be like, well, I know that my organization consumes data from an organization like the ABS, does something to that data and pushes that out. So that's where I thought I'd start today with an example from Oren. So again, my name is Michael from, from Oren. I'm the data relationships manager there. So in my example today, I thought we'd just show a very simple example of this data and services landscape about how these different connections are being made. And if, you, if you're all familiar with um, what Anslick have done on the FSDF, they have a thing called the FSDF link. And this link actually provides connections between different things. Um, so what we're trying to achieve here in, in this um, example, but more broadly in the exercise, is do a very similar sort of thing, um, but try and capture it in slightly different perspective in terms of looking at those different objects which I presented before on the slides. The different objects being um, the data, obviously, the data store, um, which may be identified by some, a URL or some sort of business identifier, the metadata or the metadata registry. So in the Oren example I've got here, you'll see I've got those three main um, circles which I presented before. ABS, ORN, and data.gov.au. And in this example, what I've tried to do is take a particular case study. So for those of you who may or may not know the ABS, they provide data out via a protocol or te technology called STMX. Now the STMX protocol, if we come down here and look at the ABS, this provides a mechanism to actually slice up a data cube. Now, for Oren, that's fantastic because we like to provide that data back to our users in different ways. And the actual mechanism to actually interface with the STMX service at ABS, in this example here, requires Oren to actually connect via a geo server into the ABS STMX endpoint. Now, initially, we have to harvest the metadata from a particular data cube, understand all the different dimensions um, of that, um, the actual headers and all that different information to actually populate, I guess, a schema or a table in our data store. And once we've got that structure, then we can pull through the actual data from that. So in this particular example, you'll see two arrows or two relations I've drawn between the ABS and ORM one harvesting the metadata record, which is in purple on the right-hand side, and the other harvesting the data itself in green on the left-hand side. So once that harvest has occurred, 
Oops. We then have the data within our geo server ready to go. And we can then start to do things with that. Now, Iron typically deals with geospatial data. So the data we actually get from the ABS doesn't have any geometry associated with it. So often one of the first tasks we do at Iron is to actually join that data to a corresponding geometry so that we can actually display it on the map and do analysis and all that sort of stuff. But really in this example here, what I've shown is the flows for the metadata side of things. So um, not looking at the geographic boundaries or anything like that. That's why I've left the PostgreSQL database is disconnected at the moment. So don't worry about that. Um, I just wanted to show the flow of metadata. After it's been populated in the data store, um, Oren has what they call a metadata tool. And this metadata tool harvests the metadata from our GeoServer endpoint, which is ultimately being pulled from the ABS. And once we've defined a metadata record within our metadata repository, we can then start to then do stuff with the data set. Ultimately, once we have the glue in place, we can then start to connect that to Oren's data registry and that's corresponding metadata repository so that we can ultimately flow the data into what we call the Oren portal. So we can pull the data and the metadata in. Um, and on the flip side, thinking externally, we can then update our metadata records in our CCAN instance to make sure that the actual metadata itself is discoverable by other organizations. So once we've essentially defined and curated a data set by pulling data from the ABS, doing some sort of manipulation with it, whether we're joining it to geometry or doing some sort of other analysis to create an indicator perhaps, we then need to make that available and sorry, findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable or fair for other researchers to come in and access. And for that, we need to actually make it discoverable. Um, so typically what happens here is we then obviously have an endpoint on our CCAN, which allows metadata to be harvested. In this case, it's a WMS. And then data.gov.au can then harvest that into its own metadata repository. So quite a bit in that particular example um, to get started. Um, but hopefully that provides a bit of an overview of what we're seeking to achieve here. Now, obviously, provide a really technical view of, of, of Oren. That's because that's my, my job. Um, but other people may actually have their own areas of expertise, which would be look quite differently here. Uh, obviously seeing if someone posting a really good graphic here on the right hand side of this particular page to look at how complex their system is, which is fantastic. Um, someone's actually, um, I guess, engaged with the, the, the example I've presented and said, well, hang on, at our company, at our organization is actually a lot more complex than that, um, which is understandable. So flipping back to the presentation, I get onto what we're actually looking to do today. So we've gone through the mirror introduction and now we're on to the actual collaborative task. So once you've had a bit of a look at the example and have it at play with mirror, we're now onto the next thing. And the fourth slide here, you'll see that what I've done is I've created four key reference points. Now, from a spatial perspective, this makes sense. We've got reference points, whether we're doing georeferencing, whatever it may be. But here, what I thought we'd start off with was looking at, well, what are the different aggregators for data? I guess more looking at the other end or the sinks of this environment. Organizations such as data.gov.au, Knowledge Network, Google Dataset Search, or Research Data Australia. And how we then might start to hang other organizations from these points. Now, this may seem like a bit of a daunting, daunting task, but looking back at the Oren example I provided before, where I looked at, say, sucking data out of ABS, doing something with it internally at Oren, and then allowing, creating an endpoint with an Oren to allow that data to be harvested by data.gov.au, we can start to build up the relations in this space. Now, very aware that not, every, not everybody is going to understand the technical dimensions of this um, space as well as others. Um, but certainly in terms of being able to draw the, the key objects, um, that is an organization and the different connections. And if I just scroll all the way back to the legend page, which is on the, on the third slide here, 
we've got a bit of a legend here. Um, now typically here on the, for those who are tracking, the legend section here, we've got, I guess, an, three main objects, that being an organization, which I've clearly described. Then we've got within an organization, we have an application layer or something which hosts a service. Now, the services I described before, um, whether that's a data service, a data store, metadata service, or something like a metadata registry. And then we've then got the relationships between these, whether that's a flow of metadata or a flow of data between these different services. Now, these different objects, um, what I might do is actually create a version of this to share on the main page, just so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, for those that have to keep scrolling back, oh, Michael. Hey, you're done? I've okay. just created a copy. Oh, great. Okay. So we can head back over here. Brilliant. Thanks, Karen. Um, so we've got a legend over here, so you can have a look at that. And these objects can be drawn by just coming over the toolbar here. And whether it's a circle, drawing a circle, whether it's a square, drawing a square, don't worry too much about the colors or anything like that. And we're just trying to at least start to draw um, this landscape ourselves. So um, from this point in the presentation, we're now moving into a period of basically having a go for the next 20 minutes, doing some drawing on this space and really starting to, I guess, make some connections between different organizations, services or applications in this area to facilitate the flow of metadata or data between different groups. So Kieran, have we set up the Zoom breakout rooms as yet? Um, Melanie, Melanie was doing that and we're gonna set it up into four different groups. So that'd be roughly about six people per, per group. Brilliant, okay. So I can see some really interesting people already started with their organizations, um, which is fantastic. Um, but to actually help the actual conversation piece, so people aren't just in a silent bubble, we'd have these Zoom breakout rooms to allow some uh, coordination communication, so. For those who have started already, fantastic. For those who are a bit unsure of what to do, um, feel free to use the chat window or use the breakout rooms, um, which we're trying to get up behind the scenes at the moment. Um, or if you have any questions, feel free to uh, turn your microphone on and just ask at the moment. Um, if you got really stumped and not too sure how to work things. Um, Hopefully you received a breakout room invitation now. So I'm off to breakout room three, and we'll touch base with you um, over the course of the next 20 minutes as we start to draw some of these objects in the Miro space, um, just try and start to map the data and services landscape. And I also mentioned that um, Kieran, and Melanie will also be uh, doing the tours around to make sure we're um, we're okay with the task. And if there are any questions in those breakout rooms, um, feel free to ask and um, we'll try and get around to you all. Otherwise, um, yeah, have fun. It should be a really good activity. So um, this is the start of just this mud map exercise to really start to think about what are the connections and how we can start to get this information um, recorded. So welcome back everybody. Some people are still playing around in the mirror world. Hopefully you've uh, been enjoying this particular activity. We'll just give people a, another minute or two to find their way back here.
So welcome back everybody, back into the uh, the Zoom world from our mirror world. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that activity. Um, it was interesting, obviously, to see a number of different things coming on. Um, I know people are still playing around there, which is great to see. Um, a really big task, obviously, to uh, to start this, but I think today really was great to start thinking about this from a mud mapping perspective to say what are the different the key actors in this space and how are they actually how do they currently interact but also how might they interact in the future um, what are the different opportunities that are here um, I guess there's from from my breakout group um, there is particularly an opportunity for learning a huge opportunity for learning to say well okay oh you're drawing data from over there and using that technology um, how might I might start to think about bringing that into my organization or what are the different capabilities that I might look at or these sorts of different questions um, or what are some of the other different value adds that may exist in this space um, which I might not have thought about or which I have thought about but I'm actually now starting to think about more more so so looking more broadly at the um, I guess the overall task we've set today did anybody like to comment at all on the activity, um, what they found worked well, what hasn't worked well? Um, we've just got a couple of minutes for basic feedback at the moment. Um, and then what we'll look at then is next steps. So opening up the floor um, to any comments um, around this activity in this space. Um, Peter Walsh from IMS. This does a great job of mapping out the infrastructure. I've added a couple of green boxes to the little section we've been working on that also identifies the governance that sits over the top of it, which might be a worthwhile addition. Yeah, that looks, that looks fantastic. I, I think that extra layer um, on top of that um, is very important. We look at this um, beyond just the technical connections here. Does anybody else have any um, comments or like to talk to any of the work that they've drawn on the board at all? Um, this is Sue Lin from Oren. I just want to say how great um, it was to actually network with other people who you wouldn't usually cross paths with and then also visually see the the landscape like it's 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 quite it's quite um, enormous when you come to think of it you know the amount of effort that goes into each of these kind of data maintenance aggregation it, it's almost fed up to like a greater good kind of thing. <laughs> No, it's, it was a good, very good exercise, Michael. Thanks, uh, Sylvain. Melbourne here, Michael. I'm just suggesting that maybe we need something in the report that will deal with the acronyms. I mean, most of us will know most of them, but that won't always be the case. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that, um, definitely. Um, particularly, even in my early example, I started throwing around terms like SDMX and all this stuff. There's, there's a huge amount of um, acronyms that are out there and I, I agree that'd be really good if we could actually have a, um, a repository of those um, not thinking about a vocabulary Simon but I'm um, just thinking more generally I think it'd be a really good um, asset for everyone anybody else like to discuss um, their feelings about the activity or also would like to talk to what they've drawn on the map uh, just a quick comment which is that uh, this is showing what's in place and a lot of that's as a result of uh, significant well resourced activities. Um, I guess there's probably a, uh, a view of this, which is where are the gaps, where are the opportunities, which um, are there and, and there are barriers, they aren't, they aren't happening for, and for why, you know, what's the potential uh, level of um, uh, data sharing and exploitation we should be aiming at. Yeah, it's great. Some people are still drawing in the mirror world, um, which is great. Um, and uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, from a, at the moment, we've just drawn connections between different things. It does look like a lovely bowl of spaghetti with meatballs. But um, certainly, uh, this is something that we're going to hopefully continue with in the future. So what I'll do is I'll just share my um, presentation slides again. We've just got, I've got one last slide. So 
so now we've had a crack at the doing the mud map and starting to even just conceptualize how we do actually even do this exercise um, and it's been great to hear some preliminary feedback at the moment it'd be really good to get some more around this um, and a number of different questions been coming through in the different groups we'll try and capture that um, as we go forward but in terms of future, um, for those people that are actually really interested in this exercise, um, we are looking to potentially establish a working group to try and start to flesh things out. Um, what's been drawn on here, some people, as I said before, were technical experts. They're able to understand you know, their patch and able to put in some of the applications and services, which are, you know, and how they would connect up internally. Others um, are more focused on the organizations about how they're pulling data in from different places and sharing it. Um, but I guess maybe there are some other aspects here. Um, like Rob just mentioned, for example, Google Dataset Search doesn't have any connections on at the moment. Um, that may be an opportunity for some people, or maybe something which they may investigate a bit further within their organizations to say, well, hey, how do we get on top of that? Or how do we then work with that? Um, so there are different different ways we can engage with this moving forward. So a working group in this space um, could actually be a sub, sub, sub group of this community practice, which we continue to roll on forward. And this could actually be a resource which we maintain, whether that's a mirror or whether we extract it out to something more of a combination between spreadsheets or without having to fully go to something like RDF or these different sort of approaches. Um, so we do have the opportunity, a working group. So if you are interested in this, um, what we'll do is we'll send out an email um, to actually allow people to to respond or just send an email back to us via the in invitation from today saying you're interested in participating in this moving forward and we may have a side group to actually start this mapping exercise the next thing we have here is opportunity to contribute case studies um, so as been touched on before there are projects starting up all the time um, and some of these projects do have well um, Describe architecture diagrams like the one from Loki, which Simon contributed to the board. Um, and these projects um, may have obviously a number of different connections, and whilst they may be short term or long term, um, these may actually form case studies in this space. Um, prime example ARDC have their latest platforms program or the, the current one for. 2020, but the one before that from 2019, which is fantastic. So Oren, Oren is involved in that platforms program on the Australian Transport Research Cloud. And we may actually end up sort of putting a little node into our diagram here, looking at that. Um, and what are the connections between that platform and others? We, might, we may also consider similar things for um, other platform projects in this space um, to actually start to think about um, what are the different connections here? Um, what are the opportunities? um all this sort of space so the case study aspect of this map exercise provides an opportunity for um, connecting i guess some of the, the material you've already created in your projects or your platforms or whatever it may be and contributing that forward and saying well actually here's you know here's a high level architecture or here's something or here's the value of making these connections to really i guess provide, I guess, uh, a way to start to unpack this, um, to actually show the value of making these links and connections. So um, in terms of wrapping up, um, we we're gonna have a poll. Maybe we'll have, send that out via email. Um, we will have an invitation to update the actual GeoCapCop items. Those are the ones items that are on the Google, Google um, setup at the moment. Um, we also have the working group idea for those people that actually wanna continue on with this exercise. I know some people are still in the mirror world adding stuff to it at the moment, which is really good. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, and we also have an opportunity um, to actually allow other people to contribute um, other items in this space as well. Um, so um, this opening up this space around what is the data and services landscape in Australia. Um, we're hoping to start this conversation. So I guess today has been an initial, um, let's have a go and then we can continue this forward in, in different ways. So hopefully you enjoyed the, the activity today. I know we've just gone over time, so thanks very much for sticking with me. Um, but yeah, thanks for participating and it's been really good to, to see you. And um, yeah, look forward, to, look forward to progressing this work into the future. So thanks everyone. And um, 
Hope you keep safe and